2021 was a great year for music, and I kind of don't care about any of it. The past three years I've done top 10 lists, I've raved about the year in total and the great music we got. But there was something about 2021 where I'm just kind of ambivalent about it all. Now, I'm careful not to say 2021 wasn't a good year for music, because if I did, then I would be proven categorically false. 2021 was a great year for music. If you're the kind of person who has functioning ears and a passing understanding of what a St. Vincent is, there was an album for you released in 2021. And what I'm about to describe is very much a good problem to have, but the sheer quantity of good to great albums released ended up feeling like a wash. A great album would be released, everyone would talk about it and call it an instant classic, and then it would vanish from the discourse in a week. But that's not to dismiss the albums that I'm about to cover. If anything, this list ended up being a lot weirder than I initially expected. As with all my lists, I ask that you not hold me to the specific rankings of these albums. They are my 10 favorite of the year, but them being placed in a numerical hierarchy like this is just because I think top 10 videos are fun to do. And please feel free to leave your favorite albums in the comments below and check check out the playlist in the description with all of the songs that I bring up. So, drum roll please. Number 10. I was debating with myself whether to put this first record on here because it has a certain advantage that the other records don't and I didn't know if it would be fair to put this one higher. But man, this record took up such a huge space in my brain. It was all that I thought about for a few months straight. And like when I go to sleep, I don't think about it. Like when I'm asleep, I feel all right. But it's basically from the moment I wake up, I uh, I just get this. Feeling in my body, way down deep inside me. I try not to fight it. Describe it. All right, a few things start to happen. My vision starts to flatten. My heart it gets to tap and pretend it's full burn up inside. So yeah, that's that that's number ten. If you'd have told me. When I talk about Bo Burnham's Inside, I feel like I lose. Bo's previous comedy specials have been meta dissections on comedy and performing, but I've often felt like they were held back by still having to be comedy performances. This section from Make Happy Especially, where he says, I know very little about anything, but what I do know is that if you can live your life without an audience, you should do it. And then immediately goes back to performing for an audience. His special from this year, Inside, is not held back by that in the slightest. It is a comedy special, a deconstruction, and a communal exhale. Bo internalized the past two years of Hell World and made what will likely go down as one of the defining works of COVID times. But I think more than any of that, it's a plea. It's that monologue from Make Happy stretched out to 90 minutes. And the overall message is to try to lead a fulfilling life and run from the banal horror of as fast as you can. And yet, here I am doing that. I am making about Bo's plea for us to stop consuming. I feel like I lost. Anyway, I should probably talk about the accompanying album. Sound-wise, it's a mix of the comedic piano work Bo's become well known for, and fairly buoyant, if also ironic, bedroom pop. It's a basic sound, but considering the special they're attached to, uh, I'm not expecting a full orchestra, you know? In fact, I've never considered Bo to be a great songwriter. Great musician, sure, but most of his songs leave my head as soon as his specials end. Inside, on the other hand, has songs that work just fine when removed from their initial context. FaceTime with my mom tonight and sexting are solid downtown tempo jams. How the World Works could be a Broadway show tune with its upbeat piano and anarcho-communist sock puppet. Same with Welcome to the Internet. I don't think it says anything new about the internet per se, but it's all about presentation, the razzle-dazzle, the gradual increase in tempo, the you should kill your mom. That funny feeling is such a haunting track about the quiet terror of modern life. It's the best song Phoebe Bridgers hasn't written yet. So naturally she started playing it on tour this year. Even the shorter interlude tracks like Look Who's Inside Again, the two Bezos songs, Don't Wanna no. While they gain most of their power from the special, their melodies and production could certainly hold up on their own. And White Woman's Instagram is this perfect corporate girl boss pastiche. I know it got some flack for being insensitive, but I think it does leave room to widen out and acknowledge the humanity behind the stereotypes. The bridge specifically, where the aspect ratio literally widens, which leads me to reason one as to why this one is at number 10. It's not just an album, it's a visual special. To me, that gives it a leg up because I'm not only 
enjoying Unpaid Intern on its own merits, but I can't help but separate it from Black and White Beau with his small little glasses. Reason two is, I don't know if this special is gonna age well. Not because of anything Bo says, though he seems to recognize that potential with the song Problematic, but rather because this special is so firmly tied to its time, both in terms of what it's about and how intense the reception was. If you mention Inside to me this time next year, I feel like my response will be... Uh, <laughs> uh. Before its time, Inside and its soundtrack were exactly what we needed. You did it! Number nine. While we're talking about things on Netflix, has anyone heard of Squid Game? Squid Game is a very good show. It's also a very depressing show. And as I was watching, on the edge of my seat as some dudes played marbles, I thought to myself, Man, I really want to watch Ted Lasso now. I don't mean that as a bash against Squid Game. Again, it is a great show and it deserves all of the acclaim it's gotten, but by the end, I just wanted to watch something that would uplift me. Something that said, you know, people aren't always sacks of doo-doo. It's an emotional spectrum when it comes to media. On one end, there's Squid Game and Inside, and on the other, there's Ted Lasso and... Producer Porter Robinson has always been a source of uplifting electronic dance pop, but his latest record, Nurture, is the best showcase of his talent, largely due to how it uses nostalgia. The record is always using sounds and timbres that vaguely gesture to the past, whether it's an implicit reference or even just grainy distortion on a vocal. How a musician uses the sample made famous from It Takes Two, or Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Ti having these high-pitched vocals that remind me of Navi from Ocarina of Time. But simply reusing elements from the past doesn't make an album great. In fact, it can often make an album grating. Nurture avoids this by using these elements to supplement already excellent songs. Musician, Get Your Wish, Look at the Sky, Unfold, Something Comforting. They're the kind of songs that beg to be seen live, not just for the music, but for the potential collective experience. They're basically investments in euphoria. And on the other end, the outright bangers are offset by intimate moments like the opener Lifelike, Wind Tempos, and Blossom. By the end of its runtime, Nurture leaves you with a warm feeling inside. And not that kind of inside. It's one that is wholesome without feeling corny. I think what keeps it from coming off as corny is the understanding that nostalgia is not purely joyful. There's also a quiet pain to it, the feeling like times were good, but they might never be that kind of good again. And that's what makes Nurture so emotionally affecting to me. It finds joy in the past, but the songs are not confined to the past, and they acknowledge that good times are still possible. Great record, can't wait to see what Porter does next. Number eight, the internet. I'm so sorry. I know it's been around for decades, but it feels like we're just now starting to get artists and bands who were truly born of the internet, molded in its image, this image specifically. But being born of the internet is not a defining trait for a band or a good excuse to miss jury duty. It's the music that matters. Case in point. <laughs> Chances are, while you may not know the name Left at London, you might know the name Nat Puff. She's been a mainstay of the internet for a while, and for good reason, she's a very funny person. I only had a passing knowledge of her up until a performance she gave at a festival back in 2019, and then someone recommending I check out her music last year. So when I heard she was releasing her first full-length album, T-I-A-P-F-Y-H, I set out on a mission to make it up to past Mike. This one is a record where detours pop up frequently, whether it's abrupt changes in instrumentation or entire breaks from the sonic norm. The Ballad of Mary and Zionchek, for example, is a piano ballad written about the congressman who pushed for the New Deal while battling many public debacles. But while it's a sonic detour, it's not a thematic one. Marion Zionchek was believed to have suffered from untreated mental illness, and towards the end, Nat reckons with what he could have done if he was given proper treatment. And that concept of mental and emotional wellness serves as the backbone for the whole album. Pills and Good Advice is a 10-minute opener that earns every minute of its runtime. It not only sets the expectations for the whole record, i.e. don't, but also throws more ideas at you than some albums from this year did in their whole runtime. Kudzu might be my favorite song of the whole album. It tackles themes of sobriety with a killer William Crook sample. There is a place for you here provides comfort and hope that things will one day be better. And throughout it all, Nat shines as a vocalist, whether she's drenched in processing or totally on her own. There's a desire in me to try to sum up Nat's music in some kind of buzz phrase. The hyperpop Elliot Smith, the singer-songwriter Playboy Cardi, Kanye West if he grew up listening to the Jellyfish Jam. These phrases would likely score me several ratios on Twitter because none of that does justice to the music. It's a messy but welcoming record, the kind of music that brings you in regardless of past experiences and says to you, there is a place for you here. 
If only Nat had named the record that instead of this random acronym. Number seven. Allow me to shift into my alter ego report the news because this next record requires a bit of context. So earlier this year, the West African country Niger held an election and it did not go well. What was supposed to be their first peaceful transition of power since they gained independence from France instead led to riots and terrorism. It didn't help that the country had already been dealing with extremist groups and the election results only exacerbated the tension. I needed to give a little bit of context because it helped to inspire this next album. I should also give some background on Nigerian guitarist Mdu Maktar. He's been active in his homeland since 2008 with four albums under his belt. His latest record, Afrique Victime, however, is his first with Matador Records and thus his biggest exposure to the world at large so far. And I'm so happy they signed him because this album is excellent. Maktar's music falls within the umbrella of Tuareg music. It's a genre that I'm not well versed in, but from what I've researched, its qualities include repetitive rhythms, group chants, and a wholehearted acceptance of blues music and the electric guitar. No matter the song, Ndu and his band excel at crafting these looping, hypnotic rhythms, each band member's contribution often placed in such a way as to almost lull you into a meditative state. Tracks like Talatanam and Layla feel like songs you'd sing with friends around a bonfire with their focus on acoustic guitar and call and response vocals. Even when the energy picks up and the electric guitar pierces through, like on the opener Cheese Meetin, it doesn't take away from the rhythm. However, there is one very big exception the title track. It starts out like any other song on the album, but after the first verse, you notice, oh, the tempo's picking up a bit, and it keeps getting faster and faster until the song is morphed into this unstoppable avalanche of sound with cavernous drums and Ndu's guitar laying waste to everything in the mix. It's a sonic depiction of French colonialism, and I find myself in awe of this song every time I listen to it. I know music on its own is not enough to cure the sorts of issues Niger is facing, but I'm sure as hell glad that people like Ndu Mokdar are helping to tell their story while writing some kick-ass music in the process. Number six. This next album was released eight days into 2021, and frankly, a whole lot of bands should have looked at it and said, yeah, you know what, we'll be back next year. There, there's no way that we're topping this. <laughs> Search any story or review about Jasmine Sullivan and you'll probably find the word story or storyteller. Ever since Bust Your Windows in 2008, Jasmine's become renowned for her ability to draw canvases with words, an ability she's honed with every consecutive record. So it only makes sense that her latest project, Hotels, is a concept album about modern dating and the negative stereotypes that come with it. Instead of punching down, however, Jasmine uses these stereotypes as inspiration to explore their humanity without fear of judgment. This is primarily done through the six interludes, featuring different women speaking candidly about sex, money, family, etc. You might think then, since the interludes take up so much of the track list, that the eight main songs here don't work on their own. Oh, you sweet summer child. These eight songs are some of the finest pop music of the year. Jasmine's voice is the glue that holds it all together with quality guest appearances from Ari Lennox, Anderson Pack, and her. Put It Down and On It are the two most sexually explicit songs with both having a theme of intimacy reduced to a transaction, a subtext that becomes text on the other side, a song explicitly about the dream to escape being broke and marry someone rich set against the futile cycle that poverty can be. I cannot say enough good things about this song it's the best one on the album and one of my favorite songs of the year. Not only is Jasmine's lyrical empathy so palpable, but her singing performance is stunning. Pick up your feelings as a searing tell-off to a cheating ex with vocal runs that are just... <laughs> The Lost One features the narrator as the one who cheated. There are many moments where Jasmine writes lyrics that are purely black or white, or at least when they do pop up, they're balanced by other songs on the track list. In fact, balance might be the key factor to Hotel's success. No lyric feels unfair, no instrument overwhelms the mix, everything is in its right place. Just like this album's placement on my top 10 list. Number five, 2021 will one day be recognized by historians as the year that I finally got into TikTok. It's a good time, some cool people, some good memes, bing, bing bong. bong. Naturally, I follow a lot of music people and my For You page usually has a few bands doing short goofy songs. But while they're very good for that quick hit of endorphins, they don't leave any sort of lasting impression. So when a band does pop up on your For You page and does leave an impression, then it does behoove you to keep tabs on them. Especially when they end up making the best pop album of the year. 
Mika Tenenbaum and Matthew Lewin started off their music careers in a prog rock group, but when that band broke up, the two turned for inspiration to Grimes and Caroline Polachek and Charlie XCX. Now those are all artists that dabble in 90s and 2000s electropop, but Magdalena Bay's presentation is all but drenched in it. Like Left at London, Magdalena Bay appeared to be born of the internet, which becomes clear as Magdalena Day when you look at their website. I'm so glad to see Space Jam influencing website UI to this day. From the visual presentation to their keen understanding of social platforms like TikTok, Magdalena Bay have proven themselves as marketing masters to Gen Z and millennials. But I think, most importantly, they know that all of that doesn't actually matter if you're not writing great tunes to back it up. And clearly, Magdalena Bay do not write great tunes, as evidenced by their latest album, Mercurial World, being on my top 10 albums of 2021 list. Wait. This album shows how diligent of students Mika and Matthew are to Charlie and Caroline and Grimes, tightly packing together influences from EDM, Chillwave, and Hyperpop. Plus, Magdalena Bay definitely resembles its namesake in one way. It's got hooks for miles. Secrets Your Fire pulls in disco sounds with lyrics about influencer culture and parasocial relationships. You Lose is about creative frustrations and the race to make something of yourself before you get old, communicating that tension with layers of distorted synths. Sherry belongs in dance clubs around the world, reminiscing on the loss of a friend with a well-paced instrumental build. It eventually crashes straight into a wall of synths, only to build once more. The title track sets the tone with lyrics about making it through a strange world with your partner, with an interpolation of Madonna's material girl at the end. It closes out with the beginning, which eventually morphs into a full-on dance party. And don't be fooled, tender moments still find space on the track list, like Hysterical Us and Something for Two. I don't think you'll find a better showcase of synth pop from 2021 than Mercurial World. Number four. In case you haven't been introduced, this is Hiatus Coyote. You might know them for their song Nakamura with Q-Tip or their 2015 album, Choose Your Weapon. I once saw them open for Chance the Rapper. They played songs in mixed meters and no one knew how to dance to them. It was great. Their latest record, Mood Valiant, is their first under Brain Feeder, the same label as Flying Lotus, Thundercat, and Lewis Cole. And I rarely ever get excited for artists joining a specific label, but that combo made an ungodly amount of sense. Oz Wolf are masters of Neo Soul. Each of them is an excellent musician, but you put them together and you've just plunge the world into chaos. And once again, chaos ensnares our planet because this record is too powerful for mortals. Now I can try my best to verbally describe why I love these songs. Slip Into Something Soft serves as a gentle introduction with a slightly offbeat rhythm, which is followed by the head-banging chorus of Chivalry Is Not Dead. Get Sun throws in some excellent horn punctuations. All the words we don't say starts with an extended synth intro and eventually gets to these vocal harmonies that make me want to sell all my earthly possessions. Red Room is a masterclass in mix subtlety the room sound of the drum kit being played like an instrument, the slight auto panning on Napalm's voice, and the way her voice takes on the timbre of a saxophone towards the end. But frankly, any sort of description I can provide will not communicate just how much these songs slap. <laughs> I really don't know how else to put it. To fully show you how these songs make me feel would require me to embarrass myself dancing around my room like a maniac. There is just something so potent about this band and their synergy and how they play together. And there's even room for a total detour like the piano ballad Stoner Lavender. It may have taken six years to have them back in the public eye, but with records like Mood Valiant, Hiatus Coyote could take over a decade with their music and it would still be worth it. But but also, please please don't take that long with the next album, but, but also do whatever you think is best artistically, uh, but, but, but also... Number three, Donda vs. Certified Loverboy. Was there a bigger event in music this year? Yes. Was there a bigger letdown if you didn't care for the finished result? Yes. But was there a bigger face-off in music this year? No. The two biggest stars in hip-hop released highly anticipated projects in the span of a week, and it had the entire internet asking which was the better record. So it's time to decide. What was the best rap album released between August 29th and September 4th, 2021? Neither of these! <laughs> Number 1. 
It's not like this should be a surprise though. Rapper Little Sims has become one of the top players in her field thanks to her so far spotless run of studio albums. And that run is going to stay clean as a whistle with this year's Sometimes I Might Be Introvert. It's interesting how that title came to be. It's a play on Simbi, an abbreviation of Sim's first name, and the record deals with Little Sim's internal conflict about her own personal life and the fame she's amassed in just a few years. Who are you when you achieve massive success? Are you the same you or another you that others have come to know? And can they coexist? I Love You, I Hate You takes precise aim at an absentee father, Little Q Part 2 tackles neighborhood violence inspired by her cousin being stabbed, and Woman is an ode to the women who have inspired Sims both artistically and personally. But Simbi not only shows the conflict lyrically, but dramatizes it to an almost Shakespearean level with the production. Between producer inflow and the orchestral flourishes, for my money, this is the best sounding record of 2021. The opener introvert straps you to your seat, alternating between a commanding orchestra and a tight rhythm section. As the record goes on, these two sides vie for your focus. Tracks like Point and Kill and The Closer Misunderstood veer more towards the live band sound. You even have tracks that incorporate more modern rap production, like the one-two punch of Rolling Stone and Protect My Energy. Without a doubt, this is my favorite rap album of the year. Lil Sims might be an introvert sometimes, but she's more than capable of delivering a powerful personal statement. Stellar work. I heard there's a little bit of a clang. Number two. Remember when I said this list ended up being a lot weirder than I thought it would be? Yeah, for this next record, it was exactly what I expected. Oh wow, what a shocker. Mike the Snare likes the war on drugs. Feel free to mark that off on your bingo card now. In case you don't know, I've talked about this band a few times before. Their last album, A Deeper Understanding, is an album that I... Ah, liked a good deal. And while that record kept me coming back for years, I was still so excited for whatever the group would drop next. But I didn't expect their next album to be a full dive into synth pop with lyrics about partying all night long. Oh wait, sorry, I got them mixed up with the Black Eyed Peas. Just kidding, their new album, I Don't Live Here Anymore, was what I expected for the most part. You take tight propulsive drums, infectious guitar melodies, a dash of cheesy synths here and there, Adam Grandushiel vaguely singing about personal struggles and the passage of time. The war on drugs have so effectively solidified a template for songs that make me go. But having a formula is fine by me when your formula is as consistent and excellent as this. Name a track on here and I'll tell you why it's great. Living Proof, Yawn. It showcases a newfound tenderness in the band as Adam muses about the unstoppable passage of time. Same deal with Rings Around My Father's Eyes. Change, usual war on drugs greatness with a driving beat and some gorgeous piano work. I don't wanna wait, key change after the second chorus, that's all I've gotta say. Occasional rain, a perfect way to close things out, feels like a gentle comfort from a dear friend. The title track? Do you have an hour to spare? The lyrics about knowing you have fully moved on from a place, that perfect guitar hook, the backing vocals from Lucius, the fact that it's an F major. I can't confirm it, but it feels like Adam Grandushiel wrote this song for me. I suppose you might be asking now if I prefer this over a deeper understanding, and honestly, there's no way I could answer that right now. I loved ADU on first listen, but it took years of repeated listens before it solidified itself in the MTS Hall of Fame. Only time will tell if I don't live here anymore occupies the same place for me. What I can say is, I love this now, and I can't wait to live with it for years to come. Before we get to number one, here are 10 honorable mentions. To start, Sorry. I feel like if you're gonna be mad at me for omitting any record from the top 10, it's probably this one. And it was close. But still, that doesn't take away from Tyler's most fun record in years, combining his ear for production and aesthetic with the structure of a 2000s mixtape. A rock band that's been getting buzz for the better part of the past decade with a record that fully delivers on all their promise and then some. The back half in particular is the kind of stuff that I'll tell my kids about at bedtime. And that's the tough girl to swallow. An alternative hip-hop masterwork as two people process the death of a band member and close friend. I don't think I'll be revisiting this much in the coming years, but very few records left as strong or as immediate of an impact as this. Wait, could this be true? I know Genesis Owuzu has been getting a lot of buzz in online circles, but even still, his debut album feels like getting in on the ground floor with an artist who shows boundless potential, one of the most sonically varied records of the year. 
Chloe Moriando's I Eat Boys was my most listened to song on Spotify this year. That might surprise you, but it's so perfect in its simplicity, which kind of sums up Chloe's second album, a delightful collection of indie pop punk. Yeah. Yeah, this one kind of had to be here. Therapy is temporary, but Lucy Dacus is forever. A sophomore album from Lindsay Jordan detailing a breakup in relatable detail while delivering some grade-A alt-rock bangers and bops. JPEG Mafia's producer tag is You Think You Know Me, and it was with his latest record LP that I fully realized that I don't. But I'll be damned if there's another artist out there who makes that realization so exciting. Whether you check out the offline or online version, it's an excellent rap album. British post-punk sure tried to overthrow civilization this year, and while the world may sleep soundly for now, the explosive debut record from Black Country New Road ensured that we'll have a hell of a battle in 2022. Can't wait for the follow-up next February. Yo, I heard his mama here, you know, it'd be crazy if... Out of all the albums in my honorable mentions, I feel like I'll be kicking myself the most for not putting McKinley Dixon's latest in the top 10. He seems like he's poised for great things from here, though, so even if this stunning jazz rap album didn't make it into my top 10, I don't think that's gonna keep him from doing great things. And now, number one. With my year-end lists, I usually try to find a theme for the year, and this year I kinda didn't want to. I don't know, maybe it's because of the past two years we've had, but I was tired of trying to find some greater meaning in the music I loved. And this year, I really just wanted music that would prove that music could still be music. That somehow, combining different types of wiggly air could give you goosebumps, or pick you up after a rough day, or give you a nuanced portrayal of someone else's life. And there was one record that did prove just that a record that I didn't get to listen to well after it came out. And as you can tell, I am so glad I finally got to it. In the spirit of this album's simple excellence, let me just get this out of the way now, I love Yola's Stand For Myself. The main lyrical focus is self-discovery after a major life change. As Yola says on the stunning opener Barely Alive, when will you start living now that you've survived? It's a unique lyrical talent that Yola has. Similar to Jasmine Sullivan, she's able to craft stories that escalate without feeling forced. Be My Friend is a great example. It starts simply about wanting someone close in your life and expands until she's talking about her eventual children being saved from an apocalyptic event. Diamond Studded Shoes explores labor exploitation. Dancing Away in Tears is a heart-wrenching bop about leaving someone you still care for. Had me crying in the saloons all summer long. Like a Photograph is about capturing those perfect moments in life before they pass with a gorgeous orchestral build. These gorgeous soundscapes are aided by Dan Auerbach of the Black Keys, who, by the way, did a phenomenal production job here. This is easily up there with Lana Del Rey's Ultraviolence as his best producing to date. And of course, there's Yola's voice, a wonderfully dexterous instrument from the hushed intimacy of If I Had to Do It All Again, the pained pleas on Be My Friend, featuring Brandy Carlisle on vocal harmonies, and the raucous belting towards the end of the title track. There's no way you can listen to Stand For Myself in full and not walk away feeling more fulfilled. It captures a complete emotional journey, like watching a dear friend suffer a tragedy and come out a stronger person. And it is my favorite album of 2021. I want to thank all of the artists who made such great music this year, and I want to encourage all of you to support your favorite artists by buying merch, concert tickets, physical media, whatever you can to help. Thank you so much for watching, and here's to a great 2022.